You guys haven't noticed, we're on Lesson 6 and we're still dealing with God. And I think it's so important that the more I pray, the more I, I just sense God saying, my people have forgotten who I am. Our theologies have so wandered off. They have so been intermingled with the Greco-Roman things that you can almost take some of the concepts they had of Zeus and Apollos and Jupiter and Mars and all that and interweave them into, into our theologies. And how many know it's time to get that mess out? It, it's corrupting the body. It's corrupting our walk. God's not going to walk with you if you think you're walking with Zeus. If you begin uh, having the attitudes that, that God has the attributes of Zeus, he's not going to walk with you. God's very particular. And yet I see most of the body. This morning I felt like when in prayer I, I just needed to decree in prayer what grace was because grace has been so misconstrued. And I can't wait till we eventually get to that lesson. It, you're you're going to be shocked and amazed at what grace really is. It's almost the opposite of what we've been taught. I saw a bumper sticker the other day. And I, did you ever see those, those billboards that say, we need to talk God and has different ones? I saw one. I almost wanted to pull it off his back of his bumper and frame it. God says, quit using my name as an excuse for all the stupid things you do, God. <laughs> I thought, I like that bumper sticker. Because how many wrong things have been done in the name of God? Yeah. Or, well, the Lord led me to do it. The Lord isn't going to lead you to do something stupid and sinful. Right. Quit, quit conning everybody and conning yourself and saying it's God. If we really understood his character, we wouldn't do it. I want to start looking at some of the attributes of God. I know we've been touching on them uh, here and there, but I want to uh, just... We've been learning from God by what his, how he reveals his names. Now, over the centuries, various theologians have defined these attributes in many different ways. Um, I'm, for the purpose of this lesson, I'm going to uh, use the ones that I was trained in. I find a lot of rabbis also referring back to the same things. These were defined by two theologians named Henry Thiessen and Vernon Dorkson. And many of these expressions you're going to understand or be familiar with, uh, they break them down into two categories, the non-moral characters of God and the moral characters of God. The non-moral characters are his omnipresence, his omniscience, his omnipotence, and his uh, immutability. His moral characters, which somehow or another we think the cross has abdicated, how many know they haven't, you can't change God, is his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, his goodness, mercy, and truth. Those are the moral aspects of God. And you've got to take both of them together to really begin to get a glimpse of who God is. This is the God that we're walking with. We're not walking with the God of the Greeks. We're not walking with the God of the Romans. We're not walking with Krishna. We're not walking with Buddha. We're not walking with all these. We are walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he has defined who he is in his word Mary and I were talking the other day, and you know we, we have had our, our confrontations with the occult, and we have so watered down the name of Jesus that many times witches don't even flinch when you use it, because we have so watered down who he is. But you know what makes him nervous? You start saying, I'll walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All of a sudden... The, you, you start getting these worry lines across the brow, and the, their eyes start getting a little bit bigger. Because although we have watered down who Jesus is, no one's really watered down who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. We actually have theologians telling us that we don't walk with that God anymore. Excuse me. I, I am not walking with Apollos. I am not walking with Mithra. I am walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come in the flesh. We have just forgotten the first time he came as Yahweh to show his grace. The second time he's coming as Elohim to show his justice. And if he, he said, oh no, Jesus is love and hugs. Open up the book of Revelation. Try to find love and hugs. Come on. And you've you got to take both expressions of Messiah together to get a balanced picture of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
The first one I want to deal with is the omnipresence of God. I want to go back uh, to Jeremiah 23, 23, and 24. We read it at the beginning of the service. I find it reassuring to me as I discover who God is because my God is not an idol that I need to stick in my pocket and to take with me, to have him with me. You know, wouldn't that, wouldn't that, you look at some of the way that people do idols in the Old Testament, and it's like you walk into a situation and said, man, I left my God on, 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 right over my fireplace, and I forgot to stick him in my pocket before I left. I'm in trouble. When you walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you never have to worry about that. He cannot be contained or symbolized by an idol made by hands. We find here in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God far off? God doesn't have to run to you to get to you. Think about that for a minute. He's not a far off, he's at hand. He is always at hand. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? I look at that one, I think, Luminati. You think you're tough stuff. You think you're, you're in these secret bunkers and these palaces behind guarded walls trying to plan the demise of planet Earth and to take them away from God, and you don't think God's already there. That's why in Psalms chapter 2, God can say, why do the heathens rage and the kings imagine a vain thing? Like they're going to conspire and come up with a, with a plan that's going to throw God off guard. God's got this. God's got Lucifer under control. If he's got Lucifer under control, don't you guys realize that? God's got Lucifer under control. With the, in Isaiah where he said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, but every tongue, you know, we always quote that. We forget above that. He, he said, I created, the, I created the destroyer. I created him. I can control him. That's why no matter what weapon he comes up against, it will not prosper against you because I created him, and there's nothing that he can try to put together that I don't already know about. The Illuminati can't get, cannot get enough illuminated to outplan God. And I believe, I believe in the last days, guys, and I've, I've, been really, I've been really praying this for Israel. I have been praying that some Elishas and Elijahs would raise up in Israel that are spirit-filled messianic believers. God told me years ago that, that right now, you know, to be a messianic believer in Israel is kind of a not, not so much welcome thing because of all the different conflict that has gone on with Christianity. They think that they have kind of betrayed a lot of things. God told me that in the end of days that when prophets in Israel begin to raise up that there's nothing that Al-Qaeda or anybody else can plan that there's going to be messianic spirit-filled prophets that are going to raise up and say this is what these kings are planning against Israel. And Israel's going to start learning, hey, Joe down the street said this and it came to pass and he said he's walking with Yeshua. And Yeshua's starting to call out what these bad guys are doing and when you want to talk about an intelligence network. It makes the Mossad look like they don't know anything of what's going on when God begins to speak through his people because there's nothing he doesn't see. There's nothing he doesn't see. Remember I was talking about that, that he is Yahweh, Ra'ai, that I am the God who sees? He takes that seriously. He does, and there's nothing hidden from him. God not only sleeps, I don't think he ever blinks. He doesn't miss a thing. Then he goes on to say, Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Now, we need to understand this, this omnipresence of God. David kind of wrestled with it in Psalms 139, 7 through 10. He said, where shall I go from thy spirit, and whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into the heavens, thou art there. If I make my bed in, in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. You can't run from God. You can't run from him. But how many know that, you know, if you're a Christian, you're not trying to run from God. But we, it's an assurance to us that no matter what situation I walk into, he's already there. He's already there. You don't have to wait to bring God with you. 
The great doctrines of the Bible, they define, they give us additional insights into the omnipresence of God. It says, by the omnipresence of God is meant that God is everywhere present. This attribute is closely connected with the omniscience and the and omnipotence of God. For if God is everywhere present, he is everywhere active and possessing full knowledge of all that transpires in every place. But one of the interesting things since we developed our theology is how many know science and physics has discovered things since some of these old theologians have, have tried to put things together. Our understanding of the universe is expanding. Einstein brought in a concept that he defined time as the fourth dimension of our existence. It's the same as height, width, and depth. It can be measured. It can be felt. Time has a beginning. Time has an end. And therefore, in, 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 in physics, when you talk about space, you can't talk about space without it being space hyphen time, because that is a part of our existence. And so our understanding of the, the omnipresence of God has to go beyond just space. This is where it gets fun. God fills all time the same way he fills all space. God's not waiting for time to transpire. Time is a container. Time was created in Genesis chapter 1, 3 when God said, let there be light. When God created light in this universe, the speed of light is what, is what contains and maintains time. That, it, that they have already hypothesized that if you could go beyond the speed of light, you would cease to be in our dimensional reality. You would, you would actually step outside of time. So no, there's not going to be any Star Trek of going warp 10, warp 8. You cannot transcend the light barrier. If you do, you cease being in this universe. You step over into the spirit realm. So time is a created thing. It's like a container that God filled the whole thing. That's why the book of Revelation tells us that Jesus was the lamb slain at the foundation of the world. That before time began, when Jesus filled it, when Almighty God filled it, that's why he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, because he filled all of it. You're going to get this in a minute. I mean, th 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 then it kind of hurt your brain just a little bit. You know, it's bad enough you know, figure out God's everywhere. But now we need to understand that God's everywhere, but he doesn't manifest his presence everywhere. He can't. We think sometimes when we have church and we can feel the Spirit of God begin to manifest that God came in. No, he didn't come in. He was already here. He just chose to manifest himself because he could. Because yeah. there's some places that God would manifest himself and men would drop dead yeah. because there's no blood over the doorposts. That's when you get to understand his holiness. God is always here. What we're after is God getting to a place that God can manifest his presence in my walk and in my life by walking in his ways. Okay, now we're, we're, we, we got that. We're, we're taking that round peg, putting it in a round hole. Okay, that, that one's there. But to think that God fills all time. There's no song I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. The reason he can hold tomorrow is he's already there. Now, this, 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 this is going to get you excited. How many know that you need, you, you need God's provision, God's protection, a lot of things tomorrow? Okay. Now, this will help you understand the ways of God. Because we have to walk linearly through time. And how many know Lucifer has to walk linearly through time? It was probably a shock to him when God created it. And when he did, he stuck going through it one way. Because if he could move back the other way, he'd try to go back and undo the cross. He can't. He has to move through it the same way we do. And so when God teaches me his ways, he's already in all my tomorrows, and the kingdom is already in all my tomorrows. And when I walk in his ways, statutes, and judgments, and I'm led by the Holy Spirit, he causes me to walk right into his provision. He causes me to walk right into his protection. He causes me to walk right into everything that I need. But when I sin and miss the mark, part of the, part of the purpose of sin is to get me off course so that I miss the provision of God. How many times have we missed his blessings because we got in the flesh? 
And then we want a miracle. You know what that miracle is? Lord, help me overcome my stupidity so that you can transport me from here to there. Because I really believe, guys, if you're walking with God, you have a great reduction of a need for miracles. A miracle is finding yourself in a pit needing to get out. Walking with God is God put, causes the devil to fall in the pit. You just step on over and go on. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? And we have churches today that have altars full of people begging God to overcome their disobedience because they would not walk in his ways and they missed his miracles and they missed his blessing and they missed his provision time and time and time again to where they get to the place that it, 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 is, it is crunch time that they've got to have something to overcome all the misses that they have done. That's not God's perfect will. That's his permissive will. But when I understand how God fills time and space, his commandments make sense. The whole concept of walking, that's why I call this series Paths to Walk In. Because when I'm walking with him, I walk into blessing. I walk into provision. Yes, I may walk into some challenges. Because God needs to burn something out of me or burn something into me. He has to allow me to learn things. But if I'm really walking with him, I walk in his best. Because he's always there. Guys, this is, this is so reassuring to me because I've walked into some hairy stuff before. I've walked into some hairy stuff because of my disobedience at times, and I've walked into some really hairy stuff because of my obedience. And it's like, whoo, God, I'm so glad you're already here. I'm glad that you're already here and you've taken names. <laughs> you've set things in order. I know one of the things that has helped with Mary and I whenever we're traveling or thing is say, God, just go before us and prepare the way and help us be sensitive enough to, to go in only the footsteps that you have ordered for us. Doesn't that make more sense of the, the footsteps of the righteous order of the Lord? Why? He's trying to get you to connect the dots, and every dot's either a protection, a blessing, understanding, wisdom, something. And he's trying to get you from place to place to place to place so that you begin putting on you the things that you need and receiving in your life what you need to walk with him. How many now look at the omnipresence of God completely different? So what makes anybody think that they can hide a sin? I may be able to hide it from Chuck, but I can't hide it from God, and Chuck's not the only one I'm answerable to. Dad's not even the one I'm answerable to. It's Almighty God. It's Almighty God. And if he sees all, psst. When that's why when you sin, you run to him because he knew already. He's just waiting for you to come and repent and apologize. The omniscience of God. The omniscience of God in the great doctrines of the Bible is defined as God is a spirit and as such has knowledge. He is a perfect spirit and as such has perfect knowledge. By omniscience, he is meant to know all things and is absolutely perfect in knowledge. He knows it all. The Bible talks about how God took a grain of sand and balanced out the mountains, how he took a drop of water and balanced out the oceans. You know, I... I've always wondered, you know, the, an egg doesn't roll right. Do you ever realize that? It kind of goes whoop -a -da, whoop -a -da. The earth is The earth bulges in the middle. But yet God has us on an axis and it rolls. And it, it does it to us. Look at the grace of God that he created. But by the way that the earth rotates, it creates gravity. By its mass and by its rotation, it creates gravity. And God in his perfection was able to take a drop of water and a grain of sand and do it in such a way that we either don't float off into space or that we are not crushed by it. And it only took him a grain of sand and a drop of water because he's perfect in his knowledge. That means God doesn't have to discover anything. It's our job to discover him. He is perfect in his knowledge. Job chapter 37, 1 through 14. I love this. 
Hearken unto this, O Jacob, and stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his clouds to shine? Dost thou know the balance of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? Now, I'm going to bring it home just in a minute. We need to understand the, the perfection of God, that he knows everything in perfection. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord and who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That his ways are beyond finding out. If God didn't tell you, you couldn't find it out. That's pretty simple. And that's why we have, that's why we have a special revelation. God, you couldn't find it out by observation. You couldn't find it out by scientific methodologies. You cannot quantify it even with quantum algebra. You, can't, you cannot quantify the wisdom and the understanding of God because it transcends all that. We may have figured out how to split an atom. We may have figured out how to collide at uh, atoms together to try to get the, discover the Big Bang Theory at the CERN uh, collider. That's one thing. You know, and you say, well, that, isn't that a marvelous wonder? Any kid can take two tr trucks and smash them together and have parts fly apart. Because that's about all that is. Eli and Nathan are experts at that kind of physics. They just need, they, these guys are just bigger boys with bigger toys, and they need four or five billion dollars to be able to do it with atoms. But any kid can do it with a Tonka truck. I want one of them to be able to stand back and just out of the wisdom empower them to speak a universe into existence. Can't do it. Why? Because you cannot quantify it. And even with the Big Bang Theory, you had this little mass of almost nothing begin to just kind of brew, and then it exploded into everything. That's the Big Bang Theory. It takes more faith to believe in that. Take a grain of sand, Brother Chuck, one grain of sand, and I want you to go build a castle. Just rattle it till it bangs and come up with a castle. You can't do it. But we're supposed to believe that that's how the universe came into existence. Some try to tell us the Big Bang Theory was because there was a conflict between two-dimensional realities and they collided together and created this one. Eh. And that's science and they call this fables. Yet we have a God who is so beyond our understanding that simply by his words everything came into existence. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Then he goes in and talks about how the Holy Spirit comes down to give them to us. Encoded, guys, into his commandments and his statutes and his judgments are his knowledge. That transcends understanding. We don't necessarily do his commandments because we understand how they work. You only, we can only discover it in hindsight. When you don't do the sin and you do the righteous thing and you look back, you can look back in, as, as you start getting gray in your hair, you can start looking back and seeing the wisdom of that that you didn't really know what it was doing, but God in his wisdom, because he is all-knowing, he fills all time and space, and he knows the road he wants you to walk on, he says the only way to get there is to walk this way. 
And the only way for the devil to get you to mess up is that you don't understand the omnipresence of God, you don't understand the omniscience of God, and therefore if he can get you to question the commandments, he can get you to a different destination. That's exactly what he did in the garden. I, many times, that's why the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You cannot rationalize and quantify how good, how good God is until you actually experience God. Because that experience is beyond anything that your mind can calculate. And the wisdom of the ways of God are beyond our way until I've actually walked through it and I can look back and I can see all the traps the enemy had for me and the, and the devastation the enemy had for me and how God had me dancing through landmines and came out unscathed. It was only because he ordered every place my foot stepped. And then I realized that's what his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments are all about. that you can dance through the, the landmines of the devil and come out on the other side with a song in your heart, unscathed. I'm going to start looking at the commandments of God a little bit different this morning. They're strong. They're powerful. I like what the rabbis teach. When you read in the Hebrew over and over again, it says, we will hear and we will do. When they met with, with Moses on Mount Sinai, we will hear and we will do, we will hear and we will do. But there's one that it's reversed. Now, you don't see it so many times in, in the King James, the modern translations, because our, our non-Hebraic mind can't grasp it. They just translate it, we will hear and we will do. But the rabbis know, especially with the Torah, every word, every letter was breathed of God, and it's in a strategic place because God dictated it word for word for Moses. And they said, why was this reversed? Why was it, why did the children of Israel say, we will do and we will hear? And they pondered that. Let me tell you something, the, the rabbis understand that they're, they're trying to walk with the God who's almost unknowable if it had been for him giving us a word. And so they will spend centuries pondering things. Centuries. And we think we can get her down in five minutes. And one of them, finally, the illumination of God, the light of the Holy Spirit came and goes, I understand now. Because sometimes with the ways of God, you can only hear it or understand it after you've done it. And so true hearing comes from doing. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to hear God start doing his word, then understanding comes because we're dealing with a God that we cannot quantify. The next one, and this one is extremely important, the immutability of God. The immutability. Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary defines the immutability of God, the unchangeability of God in Bible and biblical theology. God is described as unchanging in his nature and in his character. This includes God's presence, purpose, and promises. He's unchangeable. It goes on to say Psalms 102, 25 through 27 contrasts God's unchanging nature with that of the created order. Numbers 23, 19 and 1 Samuel 15, 29 indicate that God changes neither his plans nor his actions, for these rest on his unchanging nature. James finds assurance of God's future blessings is that, God, that in God there is no variance of sh or shadow cast by turning. James 1.17. After referring to his, con uh, his constant patience, long-suffering, and mercy, God concludes with a general statement of his immutability. And that's found in Malachi 3.6. For I, for I, the Lord, change not. And I like it goes on and says, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I, I, I think it's very interesting that he used Jacob, not Israel. Jacob was the conniver before God changed his walk. Listen here, you bunch of surplanters and connivers. The only reason that you're not consumed is I don't change. <laughs> and if there's hope for that, there's hope for me. I, 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 I find great comfort in Jacob. 
It goes on to say, God's immutability is a great source of comfort to the believer. Whereas God is constant in his wrath against sin, he is equally constant in his forgiveness in response to faith and repentance. God's immutability gra- grants the assurance that he who has started a good work in you is able to carry it on to completion. I like that. The plan that God had for you, if you walked with him, he'll bring it to pass. The only, re- the only time that God is forced not to bring it to pass is when you quit walking with him. Sometimes it's delayed. Why? Because God's right back where you left him as far as his plan because you stepped outside the path. In a world that is, that is in constant change, the believer finds peace in a God who does not change, knowing that truth and values are grounded in the nature and the character of an unchanging God. I want to emphasize one thing he said earlier. He said, God is described as unchanging in his nature and his character. This includes God's being, his presence, his purposes, and his promises. That also means his commandments are unchanging. His word. That's why Jesus could say heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word will pass away. Till all be fulfilled. Till the plan is done. But are we guilty, church, of changing God to fit our wants? Marcion was an expression of that, that he tried to divide the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. And after he was rejected by the church, he went on to say that Jesus conquered Yahweh. Got him under control. I don't know about you, but that sounds like stuck on stupid to me. But yet in our theologies, we are so, there, there, there seems to be this great divide in the Bible that between Malachi and Matthew, there's this one little page that says the New Testament, and we read that as dealing with the new God. And if you have that theology, then you just, you just done away with God's immutability. The cross did not change God. The cross changed us. Made us acceptable to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Empowered us to walk in his ways. He gave us, he, he replaced the nature that was imparted into man by Lucifer at the fall where man wanted to rebel against the ways of God, the commandments of God, and the judgments of God that when I get born again, I am given a new nature that wants to do the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments of God to be like Jesus. Jesus was the perfect Hebrew. He was the perfect Jew. He kept all the commandments perfectly. That's why he was without spot nor wrinkle, that he was that perfect lamb, that there was no spot, there was no imperfection in him anywhere. And then the apostle Paul says, we are predestined to be conformed into his image. And yet carnal theology hellish theology makes Jesus something completely different. Greasy grace is paving the way for the Antichrist. And we're going to get into this a little bit later, but we need to understand the Antichrist is doing well in America today. Everything is an Antichrist system. And much of the church has an Antichrist theology. Because it's all about self. When Lucifer fell, he said, I will, I will, I will, I will. Me, 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 me. How can you look at the God of the universe and be still caught up with you? I mean, I have, I've had people stupefied, if you will, by a side of a mountain range or a side of, of, a, of a, a sun coming up over 
over the mountains. I remember one time when I was in the military over in Germany, I got to go into the Swiss Alps with the young life. I was got to take a little leave, and they said, Mike, you got to see this. And so we're sitting there drinking Swiss coffee in the Swiss Alps at this resort, and I watched the sunrise over the mountains, and it just exploded over the, over the, the snow. And I was like a little kid, do it again, God, do it again. And it, 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 you were almost stupid. It was, the, it was so beautiful. You were taken back and went, you wouldn't want to change that a bit, would you? It was so beautiful, so marvelous, so magnificent. And if you'd ever get a glimpse, a glimpse of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you would feel the same way. But because we have never looked at him, because we have never seen him in the word, and we have a distorted Jesus that gives us a distorted view, then we think we have the freedom of rearranging the landscape and the furniture until it's acceptable to this carnal flesh. And what you have done is you have made an idol. And it is an idol that is closer to Baal that is closer to Apollos, that is closer to Jupiter than it is the God of the Bible. And that's the Jesus that is being preached. Let me tell you something, there's a fine line. The Apostle Paul was so adamant about it that he said in Galatians that if you're preached a salvation other than accepting Christ and you're thinking that circumcision is going to get you saved, you have heard another gospel. You've been preached another Christ. And if that little distinction, this, that little bit, would cause the Apostle Paul to say, who has bewitched you? How would he look at the church today? And he said, you're not only bewitched, you're the one stirring the cauldron. And it has Antichrist incorporated on the side of it. Materialism. You walk with a God like this, you don't need stuff to make you feel better. All it takes is his presence. God can give you stuff when the stuff doesn't take you. But the moment that the stuff begins to overtake you, it becomes a temptation. That's the difference between having stuff and having it as a blessing. And there comes a time when the affluence, you start looking at the affluence and the blessings, and that begins to replace God, that it becomes a temptation and a snare and a stumbling block to you. And let me tell you something right now, America can't even hardly stand up because it has stumbled so often. The church in America has stumbled for so long. Because what, what makes it a great church? Well, they got a bowling alley. They got a Starbucks. Or Seattle's Best, I like those better. I have Seattle's Best right there. That, you, know, you walk into church and they give you a free coffee. Oh, I just feel the anointings here. Are there so many people? Guys, I can turn on Christian TV and hear guys that are preaching the greasiest grace that I ever heard that their churches are the size of auditoriums. Because the, the Apostle Paul warned us in the last days, they will heap upon themselves teachers because they have itching ears. It's okay. You can sin. It's okay. You don't have to straighten out your life. Go ahead and just say this little prayer. You get your golden ticket into heaven, and you never have to really walk with God. If you never have to really walk with God, you're not going anywhere except where the devil wants you to go. And then we have those same people say, well, God led me to do this. No, he didn't. Because I've seen them say, God led, you know, God led me to steal this money. Or God led me to leave my wife and to go after some other woman. God, you know, this over and over and over again. That's why that bumper sticker earlier this week just, just shouted at me. God is saying, quit doing all this stupid stuff and, and using me as an excuse to do it. I didn't lead you to do it. The gods you created are empowering what you're doing. I just kind of wonder how Big John the Baptist congregation was before he had kind of really exploded on the scene. There, I remember years ago, and this was so far back, I don't even, I don't even call that stuff preaching. I was, so, I was so wet behind the ears, had waterfall going up. But uh, I, was, I was preaching in this little storefront in, in Illinois, and uh, every Sunday morning there was a dog came in and came in, sat right on the front row. And I look back at that now and say, I wonder if he was a part of John the Baptist congregation before he kind of exploded on the scene. There was a couple of coyotes and a couple of scorpions and 
a couple other things they used to preach to until people finally started showing up. But all that is in the, in the timing of God. And when it did, how many know that John the Baptist really wasn't that popular? He was preaching the truth. And because he, un, he was unwilling to compromise on the truth, it cost him his head. And yet we think if we're walking with God, the whole world's going to love us. You're not greater than your master. I should not worry about what the world thinks about me. I need to worry about what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob thinks about me and how he's walking with me and how much that I am walking in his truth because that, when, when it's all said and done, that's all that's going to matter because there's coming... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this. There is a propensity of man to need to worship. We know that this is the kind of God that we need to worship. We know that. When we refuse to worship him, we will worship anything. And we see it in, in politics. There's, there's adoration and worship of a guy running for office. Or how about this? The guy can grab a guitar and shake his hips and all the girls go, ah! And they're crying and ball gutting and it's all this kind of stuff over a guy who can sing. That's it. And we call it idols. He's a teen idol. Exactly. When you're not walking with this God and you're not learning to worship him, there's something on the inside of you that's going to worship. And let me tell you something. When the Antichrist shows up, he will be the epitome of narcissism. That will be superpowered, that may be able to do telekinesis and all these other different things, and he'll say, if you follow me and dedicate your life to me, I'll let your self-centeredness raise to the place that you can cause the universe to succumb to your will. How many of that instantly would get every world leader Every new ager, they would think, you know, the Buddhists would think Buddha arrived and, and all the others would, they had just lined up for that. When the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says, you got to crucify all that to discover yourself. He that holds on to his, this life shall lose it, but he that lets go with this life shall find it. That only true life is yielding to this God that is all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, there's nothing that God can't do. Did I skip the, the omnipotence of God when I was going through this? I saw the immutability, and I think I jumped right down to it. I think Jesus summed it up because the omnipotence of God means he, is, he has the power to finish everything he ever started. He, doesn't, he, 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 he is the ultimate. He makes the energizer bunny look like he has no power at all. He didn't have to sit down and rest when he created the universe. He actually did it at the seventh day as an example to us because God doesn't get tired. It was our example. But Jesus summed it up when, when he said in Matthew 19, 25, and, and 26, he said, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, God's in perfect balance. Wouldn't it be horrible to know everything and be everywhere but not have the power to help when you needed to? Wouldn't that be frustrating? Genesis eighteen fourteen says, Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return unto thee, and according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? What has God spoken to your life? What has God promised you? What, and let me tell you something. If it's been delayed, now sometimes it's just waiting for the right time. I mean, no, John the Baptist, until it was time for him to come out of the desert, he was in the desert. And sometimes we struggle with that. Well, I've been in the desert an awful long time. God says, this hold on, time's coming. But at other times, we have wandered off from understanding who God is, and we have delayed the time. But let me tell you something. Because it was delayed, does it mean it was too late for God to do? No, because when God started walking with you, he knew that you were going to delay the walk when he started walking with you because he watched you delay the walk before you ever, you ever came out of the womb. He knew it the minute he talked to you. 
He knew it. He knew it the minute that, that you were conceived, your whole life, and how he was going to plan it and how he was going to do it. It may seem delayed to us, but if we'll get right back with him, he'll bring us and empower us to do those things because there's nothing too hard for God to do because when God called you to do it, he knew everything that you were going to do before he called you. He'd been, he's been there. He's done that. He not only has the T-shirt, but he's the one who powers the factory to make the T-shirts. We don't serve a God that's got a workup power. We serve up God who is all-powerful. He can bring everything to pass in our lives. But I think the thing that we need to really just meditate on this week and probably do some repenting is have our theologies violated the immutability of God? If you start talking about the New Testament God as different from the Old Testament God, you have marred the image of God. You start talking about his commandments have been done away with, you have marred the image of God. Because if God uttered perfection and that commandment was perfection when it was uttered, then it can't change. How many know thou shalt not commit murder is still a good idea? Thou shalt not bear false witness is still a good idea. Do you know I've actually had minister, a minister stand in my office one day and tell me I don't believe in the Ten Commandments anymore. And I thought, my, 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 my. If you don't believe in not committing adultery, not committing murder, oh, it's just grace. No. Because what we find out in the walk, why God gives us commandments, he knows where I'm heading. He knows the steps that I'm taking, where they're going to lead. He said, if you don't step this way, there's a landmine. That's right. If you don't step this way, there's consequences for the road you're getting ready to go down. So in my love and in my grace, I tell you where to put your feet because I see all, I know all, I am every place. I know where this leads. So put, let me order your footsteps by doing the things that I tell you to do. And my spirit is in here, is right here to empower you to do those things. And my immutability says what God has said is right will always be right forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I never have to worry about if his, if his word tells me to put my foot here, there will never be a demonic landmine underneath it. Sometimes I may worry if there's actually anything to put my foot on, but I guarantee you it will not be a landmine. That's the immutability of God. But, you know, if you, if you could picture the modern-day Christian, we, we have done away with all that, and we are bouncing from landmine to landmine to landmine, and then we go to church and say, why did God let this happen? Why did God? Where was God? He was right where he was supposed to be, and he was telling you to be there too. But if we don't understand the character, the attributes of God, then our theology gets all this warped, warped out of shape, and then we start making excuses, and we make all these different theologies to explain away our experience, maybe, and not ever questioning, well, maybe what I experienced wasn't the perfect will of God because of my own honoriness and my own disobedience and my lack of repentance and my theologies that are wrong. So instead of telling people to repent, we tell people how to have authority over the devil. We tell people how to cast out the devil. You can't cast them out when you're putting them in your backpack faster than you're trying to throw them out your front pocket. You can't rebuke the devil and play ball with him at the same time. Warfare gets a lot easier when God orders your steps. He causes you to step over the holes and the ruts and the landmines and the, and the snares the enemy has put in front of you. And it makes the devil's life hard. Our theology right now, the devil's having a picnic. He is literally kicked back having a picnic. He's dining on Tweakies and Ho-Hos saying, well, I'm, I'm sure glad the church is preaching this way because I don't even have to work up a sweat to control them. 
I'll go ahead and pour some money into it because I tell you what, then they're going to make everybody else like them. They're going to become the model. Oh, if I could just if I could just pour enough money and pour enough affluence into them that they could become the model of church growth. What an easy time that I would have in America. Well, you don't think he's smart enough to do that, do you? Just bless him. Well, I know he's a God because he drives a Lexus. Got four of them. Well, that's got to be God. No. Jesus didn't have a donkey to even ride on until there at the very end had to borrow it. He said, well, maybe he liked to walk. Back in those times, a donkey, riding on a donkey was a sign of wealth. The common man, the one without wealth, walked everywhere he went. And see, by our standards of ministry today, we would reject Jesus. Because I tell you what, they would have already had him in the temple. They would have had the spotlights on him, and he would have had his own TV show. Broadcast from the temple in Jerusalem! Endorsed by all the rabbis! It's amazing how things fit together if you actually start thinking. And looking. Well, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we repent of allowing other men to influence who you are. Father, in every area of our lives, Father, if we have allowed corrupt theology and, and teachings that are contrary to who you are, and it has caused us to form idols made with the hands of the minds of men. Father, we repent of that right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that the blood of Jesus would cover those things, that you would help renew our minds back to who you really are and the, the purpose of your word and, and what you want us to do in this day and this hour. Father, give us the grace to have the fortitude to recognize we were wrong. And a new determination to go back to the Word and discover your ways. Father, it's time for us to quit being the, uh, the pinball machine, to be that ball that just goes between every landmine is bouncing back and forth. Because that's for the enemy's pleasure. But Father, let us become a people that can rejoice and dance through landmines of the enemy and never touch a one because you're ordering our steps and that our vision is true and our purpose is true because we have discovered the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from your written word. And Father, I thank you, and I praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.